country in a world of cold beer in my hand. Life is good today. Life is good today. Well, the plane touched down just about three o'clock, and the city is still on my mind. Bikinis and palm trees danced in my head. I was still in the baggage line. Concrete and cars are their own prison bars, like this life I'm living in. But the plane brought me farther. I'm surrounded by water, and I'm not going back again. I got my toes in the water, ass in the sand. Not a worry in the world, a cold beer in my hand. Life is good today. Life is good today. Well, welcome. Welcome to our uh, summer webinar series, and this is a laid back event. Uh, as you can see, please join me in my Cancun venue to. Uh, have a cocktail and you know Tony Feck last week he said there wasn't anything is it in his I'm not sure I can say the same thing tonight so I'll have one sip now and the rest when we get finished uh, I'm excited about this series because it is the fundamentals and Dr. Feck did an incredible job last week of setting up getting the patient ready and choosing the right patient and so I'm going to continue on that path today um, and so I'm going to talk about understanding bone density and, and our simplified drilling techniques and uh, looking at simplified surgical so protocols and also soft tissue access. Um, so sit back, lay back, have a cocktail with me and uh, let, let's get started. So Little Implant Company is the company for the GP and we're owned by clinicians. Um, we have a new implant, a couple of new implants that have really good high primary stability. Uh, we, we really come up with a real simplified approach to be able to place implants. And then on top of that, it's always about the restorative. So we want really simplified restorative options. And so we have a lot of options that we can use all on one platform, which the great thing about that is it really lowers your inventory and allows you to do everything in one um, with one platform, which really makes it good for your team to get everything together and doing that. Uh, we have a digital workflow, so you can work through the entire process digitally today. Um, easy surgical thing, and, uh, and then we're value price, high quality at, at a value price. And so the other thing that we have that we're really excited about is called Mentor in a Box. And the great thing is if you look at the mentors on the bottom, these are the people that are doing the webinar series. So um, the great thing is what that means is when you purchase a kit and you open up your implant, you're gonna have one of our clinicians that will be your mentor. And that can be anything from clinical to practice management to you know anything that, that goes with implants. So we really want you to be successful and this has been a very successful mentor's box has been very successful for us as well. And so this is the, the rest of the team and um, so it also you'll see here Guy Gross and Mark Nevins um, in addition to the ones you saw you saw there as well. So I am in private practice in San Antonio and I'm an adjunct clinical professor uh, at the dental school here in San Antonio. And I'm also the clinical director of, of Little Implant Company. So I get excited about implants because of what we do for patients. And at the end of the day, that's really what it's all about is, is you know, making a difference in patients' lives. And that's really our gift with implants. So if we can have somebody that is just devastated by, by not being able to keep crowns on, and we can go in and place artificial roots and build them a restoration that puts them back and makes them whole again, you know, that's, that's why we do this. And, you know, same thing here. I mean, he'll tell you that he went from biker to banker um, and the confidence that it portrayed. And again, we don't sell implants. What do we do? We, we give people smiles. We give people confidence. We, we'll give them the ability to eat what they want to eat. And that's a big deal of, of what we can do. So Dr. Feck brought you to, okay, this is a good patient from a medical standpoint. Um, from the bone requirements and tissue requirements that we talked about before. So now I'm going to take you from that point to placing the implant and, and looking at the restorative option. And I always say, see the end before you start. So think restorative first. So if you're looking at a single tooth, you can see I'm going to look at the space I have. I'm going to look at the occlusal part that I have and really think 
um, what I'm going to do. And I'm also looking at what the tissue is going to be like and how I'm going to access that area to be able to place the implant. So everything we do is restorative driven. And so you really want to use all the technology to be able to see that end before you start. So all the things that I have listed there, starting with a wax up. And I'm real big on, on a wax up and seeing what, what I can do. But I also want to go in my head, okay, what options do I have? And with our system, we have a really good stock abutment. You can make a custom abutment out of zirconia or titanium. You can make that with a gold hue to give it a little more warmth, and then you can do screw retain. So we have the full gamut of, of single teeth options, and then we also have the full gamut of edentulous options as well. So uh, all the different removable things and the multi-unit for fixed solutions as well. And we, we have a course that deals with just the fixed solutions and the edentulous solutions as well. So when you're looking at diagnostic wax up, there's nothing wrong with still going old school and doing a doing a, a wax wax up and or using denture teeth and waxing it up. And sometimes I'll do that and then scan it in to, to make it digital. But today we have the ability to use digital workflow. So I can go in and do a virtual wax up and uh, communicate real well with that. And the idea is that before we put the implant in, we want to visualize what our final is going to be. And if you look on the left here, all the anatomical structures are pre-measured so that you know that you're going to stay away from that. The other thing I'm looking at is what's the density of the bone here? That's going to kind of tell me my protocol. Um, what's my soft tissue look like? So those are the things I look at and then once I do that then I can execute really well and that allows me to go from placement to healing to scanning, to delivering a screw retain restoration. So that's the plan that we want to go through. So that case was a lower case, and you can see in that case, we know the bone's very dense. It's type one bone, it's gonna be very hard bone. In this case, we can see that the bone is not as dense and we have less bone to work with. So in this case, we're gonna go through and use that to be able to you know, plan appropriately. And so you can see in this case, we used a Pamela Ray implant and you can see that goes from a 385 down to a 2.2. And so in a situation where you don't have a lot of bone and you're limited on space, that's a good solution in, in that case. So when we start looking at determinants of success, we talk about bone volume and bone quality, but it's real important to look at what the tissue quality is. And the reason is once that implant's in, we're gonna maintain that for a long, long time. And so we need to make sure that we are giving the proper contour to, to that restoration. Then we wanna look and make sure we put the implant in the right position because that's gonna help with make sure that the patient can maintain it and, and do that. So when we talk about the different bones that we can do, um, you know, type one bone is, you know, lower mandible, very dense bone. Um, you know, upper anterior is going to be more medium type bone. And then posterior, upper posterior is going to be softer bone. And one of the ways that you can determine this, obviously you can use the radiographs, you can use CBCTs and kind of look at the density. But my, what I find is that first two millimeter drill, when I make my first access into that bone, that's going to tell me what the what the density of that bone is. So if I go in and I know it's very, you know, very difficult to go in, I have to use up and down pumping motion to go, well, you've got more dense bone. If it drops in very easily, well, then you know you have softer bone. And that's how you're going to decide how you're going to take care of that situation. So that's an important, important point. And then when we're planning this, the better we put the implant in the right position, the better off we are. And we're, we're able to at least get two millimeters of bone around the entire implant, we're gonna be better. And sometimes bigger is not better. It's sometimes better to have a smaller implant with more bone to get a result. So when we look at tissue, we'd like to have three millimeters of thick keratinized tissue, um, non-mobile tissue, no infection, uh, healthy contour. So a lot of times we have to do something to that tissue to get it healthy before we can go and look at placing implants. All right, let's talk about access. So when you look at how am I going to access the situation? Well, number one, you can always flap it. And so that's certainly a, a good way to go. It allows you to visualize everything really well. Um, and so that's certainly a good choice. But if you do 
assess the mucogingival junction and you do have really good plentiful keratinized tissue, then you can go and you can use one of the alternatives, which would be a punch or using a laser. And sometimes you can do a mini flap where you just use a smaller flap um, just to be able to access your site. So all those are good options and you need to look and, and see. So let's look at some of them. So here's a case where this has really good volume of tissue, very good keratinized tissue. So in this case, I was able to go ahead and use a punch and we'll talk about how you punch this in some cases down the road. But you can see we've, we've made the two millimeter pilot drill and now we punch so that we make sure that when we punch it, we've got a perfectly centered situation for our implant. So that's one technique. The other technique is to use a laser. And so, you know, the good thing about, you know, using a laser is, you know, it's going to be sterilizing at the same time. There's going to be less bleeding um, and better healing at the end of the day. So um, this was done with a CO2 laser. And the reason I like CO2 is that the energy is not absorbed by the implant so it's going to bounce off because it works on water absorption so um, this is a situation to to do that with the laser you can also use lasers to uncover so in this case um, you can see on the left i'm kind of outlining where it is but one of the tricks when you do second stage is to use that guide keep it keep that guide place the guide back in when you uncover i go in use the laser make a little dot of where I'm going to open that tissue, then I can decide if I can flap it, if I need to punch it, whatever I need to do or, or continue use the laser. So that's another good solution for that. But a lot of times, if you look at this case, you can see that we don't have good keratinized tissue throughout the whole area. So in this case, we definitely want to flap. We want to make sure that we make our flap at least two millimeters into keratinized tissue and move that um, over like we're doing here. And now once we do that, you can see I've placed a healing abutment and then I'm gonna suture around that area so that um, I'm gonna move some of that keratinized tissue over. Here's another example. So decide where I'm gonna have the placement to be, whether you're doing that you know, by hand or you're doing it with a guide. And then you go in and now you can see I make my incision, place my implant, suture that together. And now because we planned it, you can see we've got beautiful, healthy tissue to work with, and then we use a screw retains or conia restoration. So that's those are some of the choices that you have for, for doing that. Let's talk about drilling protocol, and, and especially with our kit. And you can see it's a very simple, well-designed kit. Everything you need is right there. Um, it's very easy to turn this kit around. Uh, my team loves you know, this ability to do that. And now we also, on the right, you see we have a dedicated kit that is just for restorative. So when you're doing restorative cases, you don't have to take your surgical um, situation out. So the, the tray inside comes out. You can set that on your on your bracket tray, on your surgical area. Um, it does move around, so it's really easy to use and do that. The real value is the multi-drill protocol. So with this system, you're able to um, either do it in a traditional manner and use step by step by step all the way through, or you can use as little as two drills. So it's designed to be able to do it either way. Um, they cut very precise. Um, they're very sharp, they work really well. Um, and so the other thing that's great is if you look at them, every marking is the same on every drill. They're also color coded to the implant. So yellow is, you know, 375, uh, 385, blue is four, um, green is five, purple is, is six. So you have that color coding all the way. And if you notice too, all the markings, um, are the same and it's real easy. We have a seven, then we have two shaded areas. Bottom of the shaded area is, is eight, top of the shade area is 10. The line in the middle is 11 and a half. The next shaded area comes and we have um, 13 at the bottom of the shade and 15 at the top of the shade. And if you go all the way to the hub, then when you go to the hub, then you're gonna be at 17 millimeters. So very consistent, very easy to use um, solution for that. So as you can see here, all the depth uh, markings are the same. And then there's the, we have a 385, a 4.2, a 5.0, and a 6.0 um, solution for that. And like I told you, you can do a two drill concept where you could go to your 2.0 drill and then directly to the implant you're using or you can go step by step by step. I actually prefer to go step by step 
Um, and sometimes I'll use a combination. Well, I'll go two millimeter. If I'm going to do a four, I'll go two and then three and then four. I like to do one before my final just to give me that little bit more control um, to do that. But you have the option to do that. And there are cases where it's, you know, second molar and I can't really get good access back there. That's a great solution to be able to do a two, a two drill concept. So you have the, the choice. You can do it however you want to do it. The other thing we're going to talk about is, is setting the, the, the motor. And so you want to set it at 20 to 1. And we really like going slower speed. So anywhere between 400 and 600 RPM is what we recommend. And we just find that that generates less heat. You have a little more control. Um, and so that's what we recommend to, today in our system. And we want to set the torque at about 45 Newton centimeters. And then always you want adequate volume of water. You can't use enough water. You want to make sure you're cooling that site um, as you do it. So this is this is our recommended protocols uh, for drilling. We also now have the ability to place the implant with the handpiece, if that's the, the technique you prefer, but you always can go back and place it by hand, or you can use a combination. A lot of times I'll use the motor to place my initially, and then I'll finish it by hand. And that's just a technique that works well for me. Um, either either way. So one prosthetic platform means that every abutment, every impression coping, everything, scan bodies all fit every size implant. So you don't have to go, oh, do I have a impression coping for the four or the five? Everything fits the same. So it makes it real easy in, in inventory to do that. And we're continually working on the prosthetic options. And so we have, in addition to our stock abutments and straight and angled, um, we also now have tie base so that you can do screw retain restorations. We have scan bodies that the lab can use and intraorally as well. And then our, our new multi-unit comes in um, 18 degree and 30 degree. And then we, we always have the locator as well. So let's go through some cases. I think that's the best way to, to learn and look at how we do things and, and make that work. So here's a case where it's a lower molar, um, one that we'd see most often, you know, tooth was extracted a while back, and you can see the bone is a little bit deficient on the buckle, which means if we're going to place it in that in the implant there without grafting, we're going to have to move that position more lingual to engage that bone. So you can see in the planning here, um, we go in and, and you know virtually place the implant in there, and we know that if we do that, it'll still be in a good restorative position. That's really what I'm looking at here. And so you can see with our plan, we're going to put a Mark Nevins 5 by 10 um, implant. So let's go through the steps of how we do this. So the first thing I'm going to do is, um, if I'm not using a guide, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to drill to that first line, to that seven millimeter drill. So I'm gonna use that two millimeter drill and go to seven millimeters, and I'm gonna place a guide pin in. And the great thing about that is that if that looks really good, then it's easy to go from seven to 10, easy. But let's say I took that X-ray and it was off angle just a little bit. Well, now I can go in and redirect that very easily. If you go all the way to 10 and you're off a little bit, then it's really more difficult to move that to the right place because it keeps trying to go back in the same hole that you made. But if you stop short, like I'm showing this X right here, then that allows you to be able to redirect that and get it in the right position. So now I've gone through and I punched through the tissue and now I'm gonna decide how I'm gonna handle this from a soft tissue standpoint. So, and you can tell here, we don't have good keratinized tissue on the buckle. So what's the, the solution here? I'm gonna make an incision in that lingual keratinized tissue, I'm going to flap it, I'm going to move that tissue over. So that's what I've done here. Begin the flap. And now I'm going to go through and start the process of doing the total depth. So since I like the angle, now all I'm going to do is I'm going to place the, the pilot drill back in and I'm going to go all the way down to the, to the depth. And you know, with our guide pins, the short guide pin, um, if you go, they're one millimeter increments, but if you go to the where it changes uh, to a wider diameter, that's 10. If you do the same thing on the long one, that's at 13. So you can quickly know that I'm at 10 just by looking at that radiograph. And so now the next step is I'm gonna go to the next drill 
And so I'll go through, and in this case, this is a number three drill, and you can see color coding it. And the multi drills allow you, that sharp point allows you to go in and follow your osteotomy very carefully. And if you just let the burr do the work, use a slow speed, you're gonna be able to follow your osteotomy really easily and really well. And that's, that's what we're gonna do here. So we'll go through each one. Um, go through each step. So now you can see I went from the two to the three. This is the four. So I'll go through and do the same thing. And again, the markings, 10 is going to be the top of this of the first shade. So remember, seven and eight at the bottom, 10 at the top of that shade. Um, and I always use that, that 11 and a half, the one in the middle, I use that to kind of visualize kind of where I'm at. And it's always easier to see the burr when it's spinning. So you'll be able to see your depth a little bit better. And so now you can see, now I go to the final drill to the five. And if you have dense bone, you really need to make sure that you go completely to depth. And so you want to double check that. Look at it, make sure you, you got it to depth. And there's nothing wrong if you're not sure, put the burr in there, put the drill in there, take a radiograph. And that's going to tell you if you're in the perfect position. So you can see, if you look at that picture on the right, I've got a really good osteotomy. Um, I still have good you know bone all around it there's no worry that I've got exposed threads in this case so I've, I've done it in the right area and now the next thing I'm going to do is go in and um, place the implant itself so you can see now I'm going to place the implant I'm going to start it by hand started by the motor and so you'll see now I'm going to set the motor speed at 15 1 5 you're going to see it's going to turn very slowly at 45 newton centimeters and now i'm going to go and you can see the blood clot is already kind of forming on the surface of the acid etched um, implant surface so you can see now i'm going to go in and very slowly very carefully i'm going to go down and you're going to see i got 45 newton centimeters of torque and, and already so now i'm going to go and i'm going to go and get it to the final position, and I'm gonna do that by using the hand driver. And so there's a short, a medium, and a long driver in the kit. And so now you're able to go in and make sure that you have it in the perfect position. And now I'm gonna check and verify. So I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna look and make sure that I have it um, at the crest or below the crest of the bone. And in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and do a two stage. So I'm gonna place a cover screw over the top, you can see that in the pictures on the right. So I've placed the cover screw over it, and now I'm gonna get ready to close. And one of the things that we're doing now with, with our implants is we're putting um, a product called Oracare Gel. Um, Oracare Rinse is a rinse, it's an antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal rinse, but there's a gel that now is for implants, and so it's, th it's three times as, as potent as the rinse, and so you'll place it in that area of your um, implant, place the gel in there, and then I usually just have them bite down on gauze for about three minutes, and then I'll rinse that off, and now uh, we'll go ahead and suture. And so the reason we're doing this is that we want to try to prevent periimplantitis, and you know what this has in it is activated chlorine dioxide, xylitol, and and uh, aloe vera. So it's all things that are going to be helpful to that situation. And then once I've done that. Just because I had a little defect in that area, now I'm going to go in and I'm going to go ahead and, and bone graft around that. So this is base bone, and so I'm going to take and uh, uh, hydrate that um, with, with saline, and now I'm going to uh, place that right around the little defect that's on the buccal area and around that, so you can see I'm going to place that. I like base bone a lot too because it, it handles really well and I'm able to place it and it stays where I place it. Um, and you're going to hear a lot about that uh, next week when you when Dr. Pamela Ray will talk about bone grafting. And so uh, I place that on there and then I'm going to suture that closed and then there's a final radiograph and you can even see where the bone graft is on that on that radiograph. So uh, that's a, a, a case on number 19 completely through. So that was a flat procedure. Now let's go and let's look at one that is um, a punch technique. So same thing, I go ahead and plan this case completely. And so you can see I'm marking the nerve. The sinus gets my attention, doesn't scare me. The nerve horrifies me. So I'm gonna always know where that is and um, plan accordingly. So in this case, I'm going to use 
a total digital workflow here and I'm going to use a pilot guide with depth control. So not only is it going to give me the position perfect, I'm also moving that sleeve and designing where that sleeve is going to go based on the size of the implant. So if I have a 10 millimeter implant, I can take that five millimeter sleeve and I can move it up or down to give me a really easy measurement for my depth. So you know, a lot of times I try to set it at 17 because that's the, the base of our, our, our two millimeter drill. So I just can go to that. So I'm going to move that sleeve uh, to make that accordingly. So now there's what the guide looks like. And I like guides that have cutaways so you can verify the seat um, as you see here. And now this is just going and using the uh, pilot guide with depth control. And again, you want to use a lot of water and we even sometimes drill holes in the guide to give you more water access and then also even use an additional water source if you need it to, to be able to do that. And so now you can see I go and that goes completely to depth. And then once I do that, now I'm going to go and I still, even though I'm using guided, I still check it twice. So I'm going to place the guide, uh, guide pin in and verify that with visually like in the pictures, and I'm also gonna take a radiograph. So I make sure that I've got everything in the perfect position. And now I have great keratinized tissue, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna punch this instead of flapping it. So um, this punch, um, which I can give you the information on this, um, if you notice, this punch actually has a guide pin on it. So that guide pin fits in your osteotomy that you already um, did. So now you can go in and as you punch, what this is going to do, can you see the little guide that goes on this punch? And the reason I like that is sometimes when I use punches, if you're off a little bit, then you got to go back and either, you know, flap it or take some more away. With this, you're going to make sure when you put that in and you follow your osteotomy, then you're going to have a really perfect centered um, osteotomy and your punch will be adequate for the situation. And these punches come in four, five, six, seven millimeter um, diameter. So you can pick the size that corresponds to the implant that you're using. And again, you, you know, I showed you on the multi drills, we're going to go through, you know, and use each one. In this case, I'm going to do the same, same technique. Uh, in this case, I'm going to do uh, step by step. So we're going to show um, each one. So as we go through here too, you can see, and on the picture on the left, what I'm showing you is if you need it, there is an extender in the kit, which is nice. So you don't have to go looking for it. It's a part of our kit now. Um, and so in this case, I'm going to use it without the without that. But if you had a space issue, that's what you would use it for. And again, I'm going to let the bird do the work. I'm going to use a lot of water and follow my osteotomy all the way. And now I'll go to the next drill. And this one, I did put the extender on. And obviously, this patient can open very wide. And it's just going to make it easier for us to see that. So now I'm going to, again, I'm just going to take, use that, follow it in the same path and let the bird do the work using a slow speed with a pumping motion. And then once I get to depth then I'm going to go to the next size and again, go through all the way. And again, if you wanted to use a two-step protocol, then you could skip a few of these steps. Um, but I prefer in this case, especially in dense bone, I like to do each step all the way through. And so now you can see if we did the number five drill and then now you can see there's the osteotomy. And now we're getting ready to place the implant. And so with our implant, when you open the, the kit up, open the implant up, you're gonna see that the implant's on one side in a sterile container. And that's great, set that down because if you have to take it out and put it back, you can put it back in that sterile cylinder. The other plastic piece, again, color-coded, depending on the size of the implant, that's the cover screw. So that cover screw now can be used if you're doing a two-stage surgery. You don't have to go looking for something else. Now we place that um, in the motor driver, remove the implant, and now you can see we're going to go in and, and we're going to place the implant. And again, 1515 Newton centimeters, I mean uh, RPMs, at 45 Newton centimeters. And again, you can see how slow that's going. And that way you have great control. And again, just let it follow your osteotomy. 
And then once we do that, you're going to go in and finish that with the hand driver. And again, I'm going to verify that I've got it at the crest or below the crest. And there's two ways to do that. Obviously, you can do it physically like I'm doing here, but you can also take a radiograph. And what I found is when you're looking at where it is in relationship to the bone, a bite wing radiograph works better than a PA because if you angle the PA, it can give you a false sense. Take a bite wing, it's going to give you a little bit better position of where that is. Uh, I talked about the work here earlier, and I, the other thing I like about this is the kit that it comes with, and we use this for all of our patients now, the kit that it comes with also has the rent that the patient takes home with them and uses for the next 30 days. So it kind of gets the patient involved in making sure they're taking care of, of, the, of the implant. So that's a good system. It's all put together. And in this case, great primary stability, good tissue. I went ahead and did a one stage. So I went ahead and placed a healing abutment at the time of surgery. And so there's the um, Mark Nevins and there's the final radiograph um, inverted. So you can see the, the trabeculation a little bit better. And then three months later, now we come back and we um, put a scan body on. So there's our, our scan body. Our newer one actually is, is more of a gun colored um, solution now, but you can see this is the scan and there's a, a screenshot of what the scan looks like. And now from that, the laboratory is gonna fabricate your restoration. And my choice of restoration in the posterior like this is a um, zirconia uh, crown built on a tie base. And so, and then I put a little bit of Teflon tape and some co composite over the top. And so we've got a really nice uh, solution. Uh, for that case as well. So let's look at one uh, um, lower mandible here on the other side where we did an extraction as well. And in this case, I went ahead and uh, did a pilot guide um, with depth control as well. And again, this is another situation just like, you know, we have a lot. This patient had a bridge that was from 20, um, 29 to 31. And of course, the anterior abutment fractured. So that's the route we're going to have to remove. Um, so we remove the bridge, and now I'm going to place the uh, distal implant first before we take that tooth out. And again, I'm going to place that first using a pilot guide with depth control, so I have that in perfect position. Now I'm going to decide, and in this case, since I'm going to extract that tooth, I'm going to go ahead and flap it completely. So I'm doing a full thickness flap here. You can see I even use a little silk suture, and I sutured the, the tissue to the cheek. just gets it out of the way. And so now I'm going to go through, and you can see here I'm doing the number two drill. So I'll start with that drill first. And now again, you know, let the bird do the work using a pumping motion. Let that follow the osteotomy. And then I went to the three drill. And again, I'm going to follow that very carefully and watch it and go to my depth between 400 and 600 RPM. Go to the four drill and then to the five drill. So um, in this case, I used every step. And now you can see the picture on the right shows the osteotomy. Now I'm gonna place the implant. And again, the same thing we've just showed you earlier. Uh, I'm gonna take and um, set it at 15 RPMs, 45 Newton centimeters, and follow the osteotomy that I've created. So very slowly, and by the way, too, I really do like our motor because of the light. See how the light comes on when you activate the handpiece? And so uh, maybe I'm getting a little older, but uh, that really does help. And now I'm gonna go in and, and finish that by hand. And now I'm gonna check and verify um, that I'm seated in the perfect position. And then once I do that, now I'm gonna go, I'm gonna put a cover screw on that. And then I'm going to go and do the uh, anterior implant. And I'm not going to talk about immediate placement because Dr. Guy Gross is going to spend a whole uh, session on immediate placement. So I'm going to let him go through and, and do that. But in this case, now I went ahead and um, bone grafted around the socket that we where the extracted tooth is. Um, before I do that, I'm placing the Oricare, and then you can see I bone grafted around it and then uh, sutured completely over it, and, and we're gonna do this in a two-stage um, situation. So let me show you now that singles. Let's talk about you know a fully uh, edentulous solution. So here's a case where we're using a pinned guide uh, that fits like a denture. And now one of the things I'll do in addition to the pins, Whenever I do my two millimeter drill, I'll go and place a, a guide pin. And what that guide pin does now is further stabilize where 
the, the guide itself. So you can see I'm going through and I'm doing all of them at one time. So I'm going to do all of my osteotomies um, at the same time. You can see there was two different um, links that I did there. So that's how I did that part. And now once I've done that, now I know that because of the, this is not keratinized, I'm going to make it a, uh, an incision into a flap. So we're going to flap that tissue open. And now once I've done that, I'm going to use guide pins to put back in my osteotomy sites. And what that's going to do is that's going to help orient me as I do the ones adjacent. So you can see I use that to help me. But the way the multi-drills work, all you have to do is put the point in and follow it. And you can see I'm angling the two on the distal. Um, but I still leave that guide pin in to give me a good orientation. And now once I've done all the osteotomies with the two, now I'm going to go to the three. And again, you can see cuts very well, very precise. You can see all of them. I'm going between 400 and 600 um, RPMs there. And in this case, all the implants are going to be um, 13 millimeters long. That makes it easy when you're planning, so they're all the same size. And they're all going to be 4.2 by 13. So you can see now I'm going to the bottom of that shaded area. The bottom of the top shaded area is going to be your 13 millimeter mark. I'm going to make sure that I have that. And so there's my osteotomies. And now I'm going to go in and just like I showed you before, using the motor, I'm going to go in and at 15 RPMs, 45, and then I'm going to finish that by hand. And so that's going to allow you to um, place each of the implants in and get a really nice primary stable um, implant um, in there. And again, I still like finishing by hand and, and do that. So there's the radiographs. So you can see we did the upper and the lower um, and in this case, and we placed uh, healing abutments on, on this one. So I want you to take a look at our new uh, multi-unit kits. And one of the things I really like about it is that it comes in 18 and 30 degrees and also all the straights. And the straights have heights from one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, depending on the situation. But what's great about it, whether it's straight or angled, everything you need for that multi-unit is in that kit. So you have your um, impression coping. It has a closed in and open. You have your uh, temporary sleeve. It has a titanium and a plastic. Um, it has two screws, a healing cap, and an analog. So it has everything you need. So it's really nice when you're ordering and doing these cases, you have everything you need in one, one set. And so now you can see once everything's healed, you can see there's what the multi-units look like. Um, we have 18 degrees in the two distal ones. And then I'm just showing you here, this is what the uh, healing abutment looks like um, that goes on top of the multi-units um, from that solution. And this is what the impression coping looks like on the multi-units as well. So that's an open tray. We do have a closed tray version, but that's an open tray uh, version as well. So you also, on these cases, and we're talking about density of bone, uh, this is a lower case where I know we're going to have to do quite a bit of alveoloplasty. So we place one guide, and we it's called a pin guide. So we put these pins in before we take the teeth out. Once you take the teeth out, now you place the second guide. This is the guide here that, that fits in those pin holes that you made originally, and this now serves as your bone reduction guide. So now all I do is have to remove the bone in that area. So I'm going to go in and I'm using my straight hand piece um, with, with an acrylic burr and I'm going to flatten that bone down. And then once I've done that, I will place a second guide that fits over. It actually snaps in to the guide that you already have in there. And now that gives you the position of the implants. And now once I place the implants, I can also have a PMMA made, and those things in the front is where it snaps in to that guide. So it gives you that perfect position. And so we have the ability now to use a complete digital workflow with, with all this. So some of you know my dad uh, was a custom boot maker, and the family business is 100 years old. And that's how I put my way through school. I went around selling boots and worked on commission. And so when I graduated from dental school, the workers made these boots for me. Uh, they put a tooth on them. My dad used to tell everybody that my son, he really wanted to be a boot maker. He just didn't have the hands for it. So he became a dentist instead. Um, so I can't make that up. That's That was my dad. And so now you can see my progression. I 
At first, my dad made me some boots that had my logo from my office, and then this this had our original um, implant. But these are my favorites. These are the ones that, uh, even though I'm in Cancun, I still take my boots with me. So I have my uh, um, the, the logo on the front and the drill and the implant uh, on the back. So uh, a good solution from that too. So of course, you know, as part of these um, part of this webinar series. Um, we want to offer you some specials. And so for tonight, what we have is if you purchase the, uh, the system with 30 implants, and that'll allow you to have 30 implants, it, it makes the cost $97 a piece. You can pick and choose whatever sizes you want. What I recommend is that you let us send you what we sell the most of, and we've got a really good, Jessica can help you with that. She's got a really good system of giving you the most used. You can also trade them back in if that's not what you want. So you can get a combination of Pamela Ray's and Mark Nevins. Um, the other and the big bonus of this is that for, if you purchase the kit, then you get to take one of the courses for a dollar. So um, we have two coming up. One is the Advanced Edentialist course. And in that course, the first day we do an all on four, five, six, some type of immediate provisionalization case with the multi units. So you'll get to see planning, execution, um, provisionalization. Then we do hands-on with models and um, and then the next day we bring in patients that are already restored with removable and fixed situations so you get to really see um, what it looks like after they're finished and so uh, it's a great course. I, I, I invite you to come join us there and then also Dr. Ray and I are actually working together now. We both have our set practices but she we work together in each other's offices. And so we also have a course now that's advanced um, tooth removal, immediate implants, bone grafting. And she's developed a really neat model that we had developed for us that simulates the defects. So you'll be able to do hands-on on a model that has really good soft tissue that can be sutured well, but you'll also place an implant immediately, extract a tooth. You'll be able to use membranes and grafting uh, to put that all together. So we'll have some live procedures with that one as well. So we want to make uh, make that offer to you tonight and uh, um, take advantage. I know you'll love the system. And then keep going with this. The next thing is you are going to have Dr. Pamela Ray. She's our next uh, webinar series, and so she'll be talking about bone grafting. Um, she's excellent at it and is a very good uh, uh, instructor and mentor. And so look forward to next week being able to, to do that. And then down the road, you're going to have Gary M. and, and Guy Gross um, talking that as well. And then you're going to get to hear from me one more time as part of the series that goes on. So we're excited about this series and, um, and do that. So with that, um, if you can, please, this is laid back. So go ahead and type in some questions and I'll be more than happy to, uh, to go over the questions. And do we have any that have already come in? I should have said that at the beginning, but I did not. Do we have any, uh, any questions that were already there? Gianji, can you see if that's an issue? And if not, um, please, if you have any questions or anything I can go over, if you, uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. And I'm having a little, let me see if I can get this bigger. Hold on here just a second. Okay, here we go. Great question. First question is, what is the uh, antibiotic regime that we recommend? Um, we do, and I would be happy to send you um, what we give all of our patients, which will be included in that, and we can get this from Little Implant Company. It has our pre-op instructions, our post-op instructions, our consent form, uh, and it's better if we send it to you digitally because then you can modify it. And we do recommend putting them on, a, on an antibiotic uh, regime. And so I would be more than happy to send that to you. So I'll have your email. We'll get that get that sent out to you as well. Uh, next question: When we when we will have a fully guided system? Believe me, I, we are working on it um, as we speak. We want to make sure that we have we come out with something that's going to be very beneficial because I know I have a lot of uh, 
fully guided kits in my in my practice and i've got a lot of you know ones that were very expensive and what i want to do is we really are trying to make it simple um, and not have a, a big cost associated with so we're looking into it and it should be coming out um, very soon okay next question um, the next question is in the case of the molar with the punch you can see nice bleeding coming from the socket can you share what type of anesthetic you use and whether you block uh, good questions. These are all great questions. So, you know, you can talk to different people and everybody has a different opinion about if you're working on the lower jaw, some believe you should just infiltrate in that area. Some believe you should block it completely. Um, I am on the second part of that. I, I like the patient not to have to worry about feeling anything. So I tend to block um, usually with something like lidocaine. And then I will infiltrate around the area, usually with uh, something like septicane. Um, and then I actually, um, I just prefer to, you know, trust that I know the anatomy and I'm doing that. So in my, my opinion, that's the, the better way to go. There's nothing, not a wrong answer, but I hope that um, answers your question. Okay, the next question is uh, the tie base. Um, does it work with CERAC? And the answer is yes. Um, there is a little bit of a workaround. Um, we're working on getting that resolved. But um, Jessica, if you're on here too, if you would make sure you get um, Daryl's email as well, and I'll have you talk to one of our doctors that does a lot of that, and they can tell you how to how to do that. We can actually have Peggy uh, call and talk to you about that. But there is there is a solution for for CERAC. Um, next question is how do we access the first webinar and you should be able to go on the website and you should be able to click on this series and then it should come up much like when we have our little talk live um, that they they are posted afterwards so yes and please go because Dr. Feck did a fantastic job of, of doing that um, the next question is uh, guided kit yes right now we have a pilot guide with depth control completely done. Um, there are some workarounds using sleeves with, with the other ones right now, but we really want to get a really kit um, that's doing that. And our CEO, Robert Guylander, is on this call and him and I have met with several different people. We're working on it right now. We've brought in some other experts, so we will have it. We just want to make sure it's the best that we can do uh, to make that happen. Next question is, in the case you presented where you placed implants on 29 and 30, what are the advantages of placing the implant prior to the extraction? Ah, good question. The, the advantage is that I'm not um, working in a bloodied field. Um, I'm placing the implant before I do the extraction, so I'm not going to maybe pass some of the bacteria that's in there as well. But you can do it either way. There's not, there's not a right way. That's just the, the, the way that I did that particular case. Um, have you incorporated PRF into your implant placement? If so, when, how to use it? Um, yes, and one of the great things is that now I have Dr. Pamela Ray working in my practice. So I'm getting instruction from the best um, to do that. And we are very excited about the results that we get from PRF. And so um, I'm gonna ask Dr. Ray to please incorporate that into her presentation next week. Um, so I will do that. So please tune in next week and she will go over those details with you um, to make that as well. Next question is, do I use Oracare gel for every implant? You know, I do. I've made it my kind of uh, my workflow, my protocol, and uh, it's just done really well. And I know uh, the other instructors are doing it as well. And Dr. Ray is included. And we've really seen good results with uh, the tissue care. Um, following that. And the other thing, like I told you, what I really like about it is I, I'm using it to pre-rent with. One of the reasons I like Oracare Rents is that nothing against Paradex. Paradex is a great product, but a lot of my patients wouldn't use Paradex because it stained their teeth. So that was an issue. And also you can't use Paradex for more than about two weeks. Whereas this wrench, you can use it for longer and, and get them to, to keep using it to stay healthy. So um, that's one of the reasons why I really like the product and uh, we use it in our office on, on every case. I also like that that kit and giving it to the patient, it really makes them part of the care. And I really like that because they need to be involved uh, doing that as well. 
Okay, so the next question is, if you don't have a punch, how would you recommend incorporating the gingiva? Would you use a perio probe uh, to add to that drill measurement? Yes, that's how I would do it. So if you're um, if you're going to use a, uh, uh, a, a, a technique where you're not going to reflect the tissue back, um, you want to make sure that you use the markings on your probe to look at that. You want to measure that tissue height very well. You want to use those markings on our on our drills to use that as a tissue height, but always confirm with the radiograph. And I really even think sometimes, even if you do it that way, you should make a small little incision, reflect that tissue kind of like a mini flap so you can visualize the bone. I think that's just a good technique to be able to do that, but you can also verify it with, with radiographs as well. Um, Okay, so we have another uh, question that they want our antibiotic pro pro prophylactics. So we'll make sure that uh, that you get that, and we'll send it out to you in a in a Word document. And so we'll make sure that you have everything that's that's in there as well. What is an ideal initial torque value? Uh, good question. So, you know. What is the ideal torque value? And if you look at the literature, it's going to tell you somewhere between 30 and 50 is the ideal is, is the ideal spot. So, you know, 30 would be a minimum. If I'm going to do um, to do one stage, I probably like a little more than that. Um, and again, it's going to depend on the situation, the patient, and everything goes with it. But the other thing I would do is, if I am going to go one stage, I will put the healing abutment at the tissue or below it, not above it, so that there's no chance that they're going to be pushing on it with their tongue or, or functioning on it. So that's how I would I would look at it. Um, and again, you know, one of the things that we're doing with our protocols with slow, you know, slower speeds and doing that is you also need to make sure you go to depth because what you don't want to do is over torque the implant. So if you go in and you start placing that implant and you can't get it to seat, you know, say you still have two millimeters and it's not at the crest, a couple of tricks you can do. One, reverse, you know, instead of torquing it in, reverse it and back it up a few turns wait a little bit, let the blood rush into that medullary area, and then try to seat. And sometimes that'll be enough to be able to seat it. If you still can't get it down and you're really torquing really hard, you don't want to put too much torque because you're going to cause microfractures, you're going to generate heat, and that could cause bone loss right at that area. So in that, I recommend in that case, remove the implant, go back and re-drill to make sure that you've got uh, all the way to depth, because a lot of times that's what you've done is you just haven't gone to depth all the way. So I hope that helps with that. Okay, how is the outer surface of the implant treated to promote integration? Uh, it's an acid etched um, technique, um, really a good a good solution, and so we're we've been really happy with the surface treatment that we've had uh, with this system, with the Mark Nevins and the Pamela Ray. Um, another question is. And I appreciate that, Matthew. It says, thank you for getting the library into Blue Sky. We almost have all of them. And so there's nothing that made me happier now that when you pull down your planning and you go in the drop down menu and go Little Implant Company, it'll say performance, Mark Nevins, Pamela Ray, and has all the sizes and everything you need in there. So we're excited about that. We worked really hard to get all that in there and more to come. So uh, appreciate that. And again, we have another, uh, another person that wants the antibiotic protocol, so we will send that out to you as well. Uh, what are the indications um, for the Mark Nevins implant versus the Pamela Ray? Very good question. Um, the Pamela Ray is more for those areas that have narrower bone. So if you have, you know, an upper premolar, you know, upper anterior, lower anterior, um, and the reason is that the, the bone uh, the, the implant goes from a 385 at the platform and it tapers down to a 2.2 and in, in some cases a 1.8. So it really gives you that benefit of, of when you don't have the bone uh, in that situation. And so, and Dr. Ray will talk about that a little bit next week. Um, so, but they both have the same treatment of the surface, the same connection, everything is the same um, other than that tapering effect that, that goes with it. And look, look, we actually are really close to having our, um, 
our 3.0 implant that will be coming out uh, very shortly as well. So we'll be talking about that as well. All right, next question. If you place an implant too far lingual, would you use an angle abutment or add bone first, then place the implant? Really good question. And uh, so ideally, it's, you know, if we can get things in the perfect position, that's always the best. But that's why we have the ability to use an angle abutment. Or even in those situations, sometimes I'll use a tie base with the angle screw, which that works really well now. We have that available as well. Or you can do a custom abutment uh, and, and change that. So um, again, you want to kind of look at where it's going to end up, you know, restoratively. But both those solutions will work, um, will work well. And a lot of times I know you're trying to save the patient from having an additional procedure. So if you can do that and get a, a restored result that's acceptable, I think that's a good, a good solution as well. All right, so what is a protocol for deciding whether or not to immediate load a hybrid case with the PMMA? Do you not immediate load the PMMA? Do you have a backup denture? So good question. And the answer is you always have a backup denture always 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 because you don't know i mean we can do all the planning and know we get in there but until you get in there you're not going to know to do that so criteria wise in those cases um, i usually want to get about 45 to 50 newton centimeters um, in those cases and again it's also going to depend on the opposing and the occlusion um, but we have had really good success in planning these and again using angles um, we're, use, we're usually able to, to immediate provisionalize, but never promise it. Always have that backup denture and you can either bury it or put healing abutments and, and reline it with soft liner. If you do that though, you wanna make sure you relieve it very well from the acrylic and place a soft liner uh, around it because that helps uh, take some of the pressure off of that as well. Okay. Okay, and we have one comment, and so we need to check on that. So we had a little bit of a pixelated or choppy um, sound in the audio. So, and we'll check on that. I appreciate the feedback, um, and we'll make sure we, we address that. Um, do you lose more bone during the healing phase when you perform implant placement with a flap compared to flapless? You know, there's a lot of studies that, um, that can address that. If you do it properly, um, I think you can do it, you can get just as good a result. Again, it depends on the keratinized tissue to start with. And I think that's really the key. When in doubt, flap it. That's my advice um, from that. Um, so we have another question. Um, and, and Dr. Gottlander, I know you're on the call. This question is, we also need to get AB workflow um, into our digital software as well. So, and I think he's already working on that. So we'll, we'll do that. Um, let's see. And we have some more people that um, are asking for the protocol. We will make sure that you get that, I promise you. Um, again, another email from that part. Um, so another question is which lab will fabricate um, custom abutments? Here's the good thing, with today's technology, any lab can do that for you. And so the beauty of our system is that it's a universal connection. So all, your, every lab will be able to work with you to do that. Saying that though, we are working on getting a preferred lab network that really understand our system and have worked with it really well. And so that will be something that we'll be sending to, every, to all the customers. Um, so we have that as well. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, smart pegs available and we're working on that so what that is is so that you can use the uh, um, systems to check for stability of the implant and so yes we are working on doing that as well um, right now I'm pretty sure that you know, in, until we get that out I think you can use the Zimmer 3.5 uh, and that should work in that situation um, what is the protocol when to use cement or screw retain restorations? Yeah, I think, you know, it's funny. When, when I first started with implants, everything was screw retained. And then when the screws started coming out the facial and anteriors and the composites didn't look too good, we started looking for alternatives. So my here's my kind of criteria. 
I really like screw retain because it takes the cement aspect out of it and I like the retrievability. However, sometimes if it's coming out through the facial, um, no matter what you do, you're going to be better in that situation to use the cement retain for aesthetics and, and situations. However, in those cases, I want to use custom abutments so that I can move the margin to a cleansable area. The other place I absolutely use screw retain is if I have limited space, and I also if you have deep tissue, because deep tissue, it's really hard to make sure you get the cement out, so screw retain is how I would do that uh, as well. Okay, um, what lab did you use for the pen reduction guide and pilot guides? Again, you know, most labs and most companies can do that. The one that I showed you here is by a company called Implant Concierge. They're based here in San Antonio, but work all over, um, and they can they can help you with that um, as well. And so, any other questions, or did I miss did I miss any questions? Um, I don't think I did. I hope I'm not tried not to, but if I didn't answer a question, please let me know. Okay. And if not, I'm going to keep it on time. So we're going to be able to uh, to stay on time. Thank you for attending. Um, stay with us on the next part of this. I'm really excited about this series. And so uh, uh, I want to thank Dr. Feck for starting us off and really setting the bar really high. Um, and then you're going to see we're going to have really educational pieces all the way through. The next um, the next one will be Dr. Pamela Ray on bone grafting. Uh, question is, do we have bone taps? Can you can you um, Thomas? Can you give me a little more of what you're asking there? I'm glad to answer it. I'm not sure what you're asking. Um, you're talking about like osteotomy kind of things. Um, I'm not sure what you're asking in there. Uh, if you can help me out, I'll be glad to answer it. Uh, we do have the ability, we have a driver that you can use to put the implants in by hand. Um, and we do not have uh, uh, things to do, uh, I'm trying to think, like a sinus lift, a, a, a osteotomes, we don't have those directly for us. Oh, for dense bone. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so the actual bone tap. I'm sorry. I understand what you're talking about. We don't have like a profile type of drill um, to, to tap, um, but these uh, multi-drills are designed very well and very precise for the implants, so we haven't seen that we needed that uh, for most of the cases that, that we've done. And so you have my email, and so if I can help you um, please email me and, and you know that's part of our mentoring from that too. And we had a few more questions come in. Um, let's see, let's see, we had one. When do you decide to use a, a healing abutment or a cover screw? And I think we kind of talked a little bit about that before. It's really about the primary stability of the implant. And so if you have really good primary stability and also the tissue, um, you know, based on that, those are the things that I use. When in doubt, cover it up. You know, you never can go wrong doing a two-stage. That's going to be the most predictable way to do it. Or if you use a, a healing abutment, don't put it high. Put it at the tissue or below it. Um, let's see. If I can see the workflow for CERAC, I'd like to buy the system. And so we will have somebody that does that all the time. Uh, I have a couple of people in mind that I can I can refer you to to, um, to do that as well. Okay. When you hand torque, how do you gauge if you're over torquing? All right, good question. So um, one of the things that you can do is, again, it's more of a feel situation than, than anything, but you also can use the prosthetic driver and you can set the torque on the prosthetic driver and that will give you up to about 45 Newton centimeters that way. And again, it's more of a feel. Um, and when you when you use the system and you and you play with it, you're going to see it just has a really good feel to uh, to be able to do it. And the drill works really well, and and being able to do that. And so we have a few more people that uh, want to make sure we get the protocols, and we make sure we send that out. Just like I know a lot of you really enjoyed, you know, Tony sending out his uh, flow chart for you know you know, looking at patients' medical histories and things. And so we'll be glad to send you these things out as well. So look forward to um, seeing Dr. Ray uh, coming up next. And uh, 
thank you for this evening. Have a great rest of the evening and uh, look forward to seeing you down the road.